and God is my witness, uh, I had no idea that this message would take on the direction that it has. But I was in prayer yesterday morning, and uh, and the Lord uh, just strongly put this thought in my mind. Actually, this passage of Scripture, verse number 16, that I'll be getting to shortly of Ephesians chapter number 5. But... Uh, uh, you will certainly see that it is applicable in, in the day that we live today. Verse 14 of Ephesians chapter number 5, he says, Wherefore he saith, Awake thou that sleepest, and arise from the dead, and Christ shall give thee light. Now again, it's super exciting to me when the songs that they pick to sing flow right with what the Word of God says because this first song said God's fighting for us, pushing back the darkness. Uh, and then I'm going to get right up and I'm going to preach about the light that comes from the power of the Holy Ghost. So I would today ask you very strongly to be, to be aware and to be conscious of what we're saying and let it be applied to your life because we don't have much time left, Brother Pete. We don't have much time to begin to to reach out to our loved ones and our friends and our families and, and even, the, even our enemies if you're the true church you're reaching for them amen? amen I'll make sure we let brother Terry finish his part in case you get distracted by all that offering that you need to put in the plate wherefore he saith awake thou that sleepest and arise from the dead, and Christ shall give thee light. It is a call to awareness. It is not the awareness of the world, but it is the awareness of the Spirit of God and what the Lord is doing. The acts of the last few days and over even the last few weeks and the fear and the terror that has been elicited, these are just more signs that the end is near. And these are more cries of help from a world that's on its way to hell if the church doesn't stand in the gap and make up the hedge and do what God called us to do. He said, in the last days, perilous times, treacherous times, in its treacherous paths that people are walking on today, the edge of eternity, when the only heaven many people in the world are seeking for is to be proven to be right. And we've got to understand that the ways of a man are right in his own eyes, and but the end thereof are the ways of death. The Bible says very plainly, let God be true and every man a liar. We have got to grab a hold of an anchor in this church turbulent time. We have got to grab a hold of something solid, something unmovable, something that has been proven to work, and it's the Word of God. Amen. Amen. Please don't nobody get scared or nervous this morning. And if you had trouble sleeping, you better wait till you get home because you ain't going to sleep today. <laughs> Perilous times are here. They're upon us. We are the light of the world. Can I say that one more time? We are the light of the world. He said, you are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hid. And again, we hear the cry from the world. I know what you think the news is saying. I know what you think that people are saying out there. I know what you're thinking that, that this going on in the world. But in reality, the world is crying, watchmen, what of the night? Somebody's got to stand on the wall as a watchman looking out and declaring the word of the Lord and the hope of Jesus Christ and the hope of the gospel and the greatest hope any of us can have which is the resurrection of Jesus Christ alive in us as we are filled with the baptism of the Holy Ghost. It's not by might nor by power but by my spirit saith the Lord. You can learn, you can work, you can talk, you can get on Twitter, social media everything but at the end of the day the only thing that's going to change people is the Holy Ghost the Bible says very clearly that we have a more sure word of prophecy that you would do well to take heed as of a light that shines into a dark place 
in Zechariah 14 and 7 and it's a refrain that's going over and over in my mind as I pray today and as I come to you from the word of God at the evening time it shall be light there is a light that the world cannot vanquish there is a flame that is burning that the world has tried to put out since the day of Pentecost when it burst into this world but I'm telling you saints of God this is a call from the pastor of this church that in the evening time we've got to let our light shine we cannot become a part of the problem. Second Corinthians 4 and 6 says, For God, who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, he said, Let there be light, and there was light, hath shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Awake from sleep and arise from the dead, and Christ shall give you light. That's direction to see by. Verse 15. I got to remember, I got to pace myself. I got to preach again tonight. See then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise. Circumspectly, you've got to receive this, what I'm about to share with you. There's so much of the religious world that is just as jacked up in their thinking as the world is. I saw somebody yesterday said, wrote, that they've given up on the world. That they've resigned their self that, the, that nothing's going to be changed in the world. It's just going to continue like it was. You do know that the Bible says that the scoffers are going to come in the last day saying that. They're going to say, Brother Pete, there ain't nothing changed since the day this world began. Things, where is the promise of his coming? But the Bible says he is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but he is long suffering to usward because he's not willing that any should perish, but that all would come to repentance. I would stand before you with my shoulders squared back and my head lifted high and tell you I still believe that the church has that answer for what's wrong in the world see then as the light has shined in your life as the direction has come to you that you walk that word walk is, is a, uh, 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 a word that is used scripturally to, to describe as we live as we walk through life as we live he said walk circumspectly not as fools but as wise Circumspectly means strictly or accurately, with the emphasis being on moral strictness as we walk in the light of Jesus Christ. Now, we see this. The idea is that we would not live in such a manner that we would base our righteousness on the unrighteousness of the world. That we would not live in such a manner that we base our righteous walk upon the distance we are from the unrighteousness of the world. Now, if you come on Wednesday nights, and unfortunately, many of you don't. But if you think I do good on Sunday mornings, you need to be here when there's just half the crew here. But you'll find out that our holiness, our holiness, which is the absence from sin, or our righteousness, which is in fact always from God, if you ever start putting faith in your own righteousness, you're on the first step to destruction. But our, our righteousness, which is of God, and our holiness cannot be relevant to the world in any way. You cannot say, just as long as I'm not as bad as them, I'm okay. Now we like to do that. You get on to one of your kids for getting off the getting out of the yard when they're not supposed to. The first thing they're going to do is not say, "Mama, I am so sorry," and it will never happen again. The first thing they're going to say is, "My brother did it yesterday." Huh? Cuz we ain't going down by ourselves. If I'm going out, I'm taking somebody with me. Back in the day, you'd get beat up for that. Amen. But you cannot... The 
The world cannot, oh God have mercy. The world, the church cannot allow the world to set any standard for us. <laughs> Nothing. Not standards of dress, not standards of behavior, and definitely not standards of attitude. <laughs> Can't. But the to walk circumspectly means, I feel the Holy Ghost right now, so y'all might ought to be, if you need to go to the bathroom, it's a good time. <laughs> to walk circumspectly, to walk strictly, to walk with moral strictness, it's not based upon how far I can be from the world, but how close I can be to the Word of God. <laughs> We find the righteous path as declared by the Word of God and then we walk in it and walk carefully in it being sober and vigilant because our adversary the devil. It is not as we stand looking at the world and we base our walk with God what we see out there in the world. There's going to be many do that. There's probably going to be folks in church this morning that are simply here because of what's going on in the world and they're scared. You say, well, I don't know about it. Look, look at 9-11. Look at 9-11. Churches were filled to capacity. Because anytime you think something's going to go to effect in your life, you look at the world and say, I better get somewhere that's away from the world. But people that are in the church cannot, we cannot gauge our walk with God off of how far we are from the world. We have to gauge our walk with God over how close we are to being in His Word. Because the things of the world, please understand this, the things of the world, all that is in the world, and the things of God, they cannot be compared to one another because they don't come from the same place. For all that's in the world, which is what? Three things. You know what they are. Lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, and the pride of life are not of the Father. They, that stuff in the world didn't come from God. It's not like God set the standard for the world and then told the church, and I'm going to put you over here. That stuff that's out there in the world didn't come from God. And don't you let some imbecile who operates in the name of God but contrary to the Word of God deceive you. Because anybody that's operating under the name of God will always line up with the Word of God. But sometimes we put the Word of God on the shelf because we want to be vindicated and justified by our own actions. Again, I will remind you that the book says, Let God be true and every man a liar. So in the middle of much uncertainty and fear, we have a clear resolution or a clear direction that involves proactively pursuing Jesus Christ, walking in the light of truth, rather than reactively pursuing an uncertain end. Because you gauge yourself by the world and the world's going to make a sharp 90 degree turn and you're going to find yourself lost. Listen to this quote. The ultimate weakness of violence is that it is a descending spiral, begetting the very thing it seeks to destroy. Instead of diminishing evil, it multiplies it. Through violence, you may murder the liar, but you cannot murder the lie, nor establish the truth. Through violence, you may murder the hater, but you do not murder hate. In fact, violence merely increases hate, and so it goes. Returning violence for violence multiplies violence, adding deeper darkness to a night already devoid of stars. I want you to hear this. Now, this is not the Bible, but I want you to hear this. I want to tell you right now before I read this next line, I already had this sermon prepared, all the scriptures in it and everything before I even found this. Returning violence for violence multiplies violence, adding deeper darkness to a night already devoid of stars. Darkness cannot drive out darkness. Only light can do that. Hate cannot drive out hate. Only love can do that. Matthew 5 and 14 says, You are the light of the world. 
A city set on a hill that cannot be hid. I tell you an amazing story. I won't belabor the point. Uh, but as I said on the Sea of Galilee over in Israel back in March, uh, the, our guide turned to us and showed us the city. It was dusky time. And you could begin to see the lights coming. Uh, and when the, uh, the, the, the Sermon on the Mount was given right here to the right of the Sea of Galilee, and I was fortunate to sit there. But as we sat in the Sea of Galilee and we saw uh, uh, the lights begin to flicker on of a city way off in the distance, uh, our guide turned to us and said, that is the city that Jesus Christ looked at when he said, a city set on a hill cannot be hid. You are the light of the world. Listen to me, church. If we are lost in the camouflage of a, of a chameleon attitude that does not separate us from the world, how can we be a city set on a hill that has a solution for a world that without the baptism of the Holy Ghost is going to be lost? You cannot like, cannot beget like when it comes to the church. That's why the Bible says, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. All things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new. And the most important place that's applicable is in our attitude and our spirit. Verse 16. Redeeming the time. <laughs> Remember, wake up. That's the first verse. Wake up and be led by the light of the Lord. Walk right as declared by the word of the Lord and not the world. The world does not determine righteousness. In any way, shape, form, or fashion. It does not. What is right to the world will always be foolishness when measured according to the plumb line of God Almighty. So awake. Walk right. Live right. Behave right. I said live right. Walk right. Behave right. You don't get a pass because everybody else is. And then he says, walk circumspectly, walk morally straight, and don't be a fool, but be wise. Now for some reason, especially in the church, whenever we say fool, it's kind of like, ooh, you ain't supposed to say that. Uh, this is the word of God. One of these days I'll give you a Bible study on what it means to say, that call, call no man a fool. Because there are some people that are fools according to the Bible. It's, it's a diff, different word. It means something totally different. So don't get upset when the Bible says, don't walk like a fool, but rather walk with wisdom. And then it says, redeeming the time. Now, what's, what's your first thought about that? Well, I say redeem something would mean get it back, right? Buy it back. Well, everybody knows you can't do that with time. Huh? Time marches on. And whatever happened in the last minute, Brother Ray, is gone forever. We know that. But the Bible says, when we awaken to the light of the Lord, and we begin to walk as we're led by the light of the Lord, then he says, redeeming the time. So we've got to figure out what that means. Now you understand that the Lord, and we have a hard time figuring this, even when you're talking about the last days, because that scripture that I just quoted a while ago in the book of Second Peter also says that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. He don't function according to this clock and this calendar that you and I do. Huh? Now we like to put him in that box sometimes, but he doesn't. That's why Paul could preach that he was in the last days and it'd be true. Amen? I want you to notice what the NIV says about Ephesians 5, 15 and 16. This is where I was at when I was praying. So I got to tell you that the first person that this message was for was for yours truly. And uh, Brother McKinney, Brother Fitzgerald and others 
Confederate among us can tell us many times the most prolific messages we preach have already been preached to us before we get behind the pulpit. Look here. The NIV says, be very careful then how you live. Now you take this scripture right there, and there's an entire religious world out there that they say it don't matter how you live as long as you love Jesus. Well, the book says, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. It says, be very careful then how you live. Not as unwise, but as wise. Look here. Oh, you got it for me. There you go. Look what verse 16 says in the NIV. Making the most of every opportunity. Because the days are evil. The English Standard Version says, Look carefully then how you walk. Not as unwise, but as wise, making the best use of the time, because the days are evil. Redeeming the time. Get back time. Buy back time. One commentary said, it could be rendered catching the opportunity to escape from difficulty. To buy up, to redeem means to buy up for oneself, storing up time, redeeming time. And then another commentary, and I think maybe fits this the best, says it means to rescue or recover our time from waste and destruction. One commentator said, redeeming for yourselves, that is availing yourselves of the opportunity which is offered to you of acting right according to God. And look here. I'm, I think we're going to find out many of us do not operate under this premise or under this principle. But it says, and commanding the time as a master does his servant. How many of us really feel like we control the time that we've been given? We always function and operate under other people's emergencies. Huh? Think about now how, how detached and distracted we have become. When you can be in a conversation with somebody you care about and your phone can ring and you'll stop talking to them to go to talk to somebody who's not even with you. So in effect, our phones and our tablets, our computers have come to control the majority of our time. I think our... And we've done it, and we'll do it again. But I think our forefathers might laugh at us when we talk about fasting from social media. But the Bible says that there is a formula for you to redeem your time. It's making the most of every opportunity. And as I began to pray, the Holy Ghost was leading me. We come into this place. It's a beautiful sanctuary. But with the first note on the keyboard and the first word out of the song, there's electricity in the air. The anointing and the power of the Holy Ghost are among us. We bask in the glow and even to a shorter degree the afterglow of being in an intimate setting with God Almighty. Enjoying His presence, experiencing His presence. But yet when we leave, we once again begin to march to the beat of a different drummer. Think about it. Just, this is very simple. If you're guilty, consider your toes stepped on. We still do that around here, by the way. Think about it just for a minute. 
I can't come to church tonight because I got a headache. I got a headache. Not going to be able to be there. Yet when I drive by work the next morning, there sits their ride. And Brother Ray, look here. When we ask them, how is it that you can go to work with a headache, but you can't come to church with a headache? The answer will be, but I have to go to work. Huh? Say, oh, you're making that up? No, I'm not. I have to go to work. I'm telling you right now, as your pastor, I got to be in church. Why? Why do I need to be in church? Because the Bible says walk circumspectly, strictly, huh? Rigidly. Why? Because the days are evil. Because the days are evil. The times in which we live, they elicit a response from the masses. When we are in fact instructed, please understand this, the response that the world has to the things that are going on in the media and the response that the church has cannot be the same. Because we are instructed just as the world begins to run around and scatter around and scurry around and, and, and a whole lot of talking and a whole lot of doing nothing. The church has instructed Sister Maria to catch the opportunity to redeem the time. How do we do it? Through the power of the Holy Ghost. Not by might, not by our own ability, not by our own talent, but we are a city set on a hill in the midst of the darkest of night. The Satan, the world, and all powers of hell cannot shut out the light. The days are evil. Luke chapter number 16, you don't have to go there just yet. I'll be at the end of the... Luke chapter number 16, I believe about verse number 19, but there begins a story of Lazarus and the rich man. And the Bible says that the rich man wore the finest of clothes and ate the finest of food, while Lazarus, for all intents and purposes, lay naked at his gate. And Brother Peter says he desired the crumbs that would fall from the rich man's table. We see a, a very macabre, a very ugly, dirty picture. I, I tried to find a way, Sister Leanne, I tried to find a way to dress this up. I wanted to, I'm ashamed to say, but I kind of wanted to, you know, sometimes you say what's in the Bible and people go, meh. So I tried to find a way to dress it up, but I couldn't, Sister Maria. But the only comfort that Lazarus got was from the dogs that licked his sores. It's amazing that an animal created by God who has not the power of choice can, in the right circumstance, function more as an instrument of God than a human being. Huh? Who has... Let me tell you something, Brother Justin. The rich man wouldn't have missed not one thing. But the Bible says they both died. And Lazarus, and we can debate, you know, we can debate what this is or where he went and what have you. But the Bible says, I, I'm not really wanting to get into that argument right now because the truth of the matter is, I don't know where Abraham's bosom is. <laughs> I ain't been there. <laughs> <laughs> Ain't none of y'all been there either. That's a place of rest, no doubt. But Lazarus died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. And the rich man died, and the Bible says he was buried. The rich man died and was buried. Now, without, again, without getting into a great debate, I would say that the greatest sin the rich man committed was doing nothing. 
He did nothing. And that's why I call out to you as the watchman on the wall, church of the living God, we cannot be guilty of the sin of doing nothing. Huh? We cannot be guilty of the sin of doing nothing. Especially when we're given the formula and we live in a world... We live in a world that much of the problems that's going on in our world is because that the powers that be have told God we don't need you. And the book says very clearly, for a land that is reaping the benefits of not having God in it, 